First John chapter two, page 1021 on the Bibles underneath the seat in front of you. We are in part five of a series called Community on Mission, going through the book of First John line by line. And I've entitled today's message, Never Enough, Never Enough enough, which hopefully that will become clear uh, why we've chosen that title as the time goes on. Now, I've shared with you before in a message a long time ago about a psychologist by the name of Barry Schwartz. And Barry Schwartz has a very sort of cynical view on the key to happiness. He's got a TED Talk that I just checked, I checked this weekend, 11.6 million views. He's talked about this. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it or if you remember me talking about it, but this is what Barry Schwartz says is, is the key to happiness. Low expectations. <laughs> Low expectations. Which, like, doesn't that just make you want to go out and make the most of your life, right? Like, low expectations, right? But like, on the one hand, I get what he's saying, right? Like, if you go to a movie and you're expecting it to be lousy, and it was pretty good, you walk out like, all right, like, yeah, that was okay. But if you go to a movie expecting it to like change your life and how you think about the world, and it was just kind of pretty good, you're like, well, that was a letdown, right? So like, I get what he's saying on the one hand, but on the other hand, I believe God has created a good and beautiful world. So we don't need to live like a bunch of Eeyores all the time, sort of expecting things to be lousy. Like, I don't think that's what we're called to do. But here's what this guy, who is not a Christ follower, gets right. I don't think we need to have low expectations, but I do think we need to have appropriate expectations. And when it comes to our primary needs, when it comes to the things that are most important to us, we need to know where to look. We need to know where to find those things. We need to know what is it that is worthy of our ultimate affection and loyalty and what's not. We need to know what can be trusted to give our lives meaning and purpose, and what is simply not up to that challenge. We need to be intentional and clear about what we value most, because if we don't define that for ourselves, others will define it for us, or even our culture will define it for us. And I don't believe our culture is all bad by any means, but we cannot allow culture to dictate what is most important, where we find meaning, what makes life worth living. It is unable to do that for us appropriately. Today we only have three verses to look at, but they are incredibly important verses to the overall message of 1 John and to the overall message of the New Testament. And to set this passage in context a little bit, we need to briefly go back to something I said in part one of this series a while ago. I said that if we were to, at the, end, at the end of the first message of this series, I looked around at all of you and I said, if we were to go around this room and have all of you rate, say on a scale of one to 10, rate the quality of your relationships, your relationship with God and your relationships to people that matter most to you, whatever that looks like in your world. And if I said, rate the quality of your relationships and we gathered all that data, and then if I said to you, okay, rate your quality of life, however you define it, rate your quality of life, scale of one to 10, and we collected all that data. I said that what we would see is we would see a tremendous correlation, a tremendous connection between the quality of your relationships with God and with people that matter most to you and your quality of life. And my point in raising that was I said that I actually don't think we'd see a correlation between a lot of other things we chase after in our quality of life. Like we could say, okay, let's figure out how much money does everybody make and we'll plot that out. And I don't think there'd be a big connection between income and quality of life, right? We could say how prestigious is your title at work or how prestigious are your degrees and we plot all that out. And I don't think there'd be much of a connection. We'd say, hey, how, how successful, how good are your kids at sports? And there wouldn't be that much of a connection. In fact, for some of you, you'd say, actually, I was happier before we were traveling to Timbuktu for tournaments every weekend, right? <laughs> and my point in bringing all that up was not to say that those things are bad. To the contrary, a lot of them are very, very good. They're wonderful gifts from God. But I said, if we are pursuing those things to the extent that we're sacrificing relationship with God and relationship to people that matter most to us, that is going to be a net negative for our quality of life. It's such a simple concept, but it's so important. We are made for relationship with God and with others. Why? Because we're relational beings made in the image of a relational God. And that's why so much of 1 John and so much of the New Testament 
talks about the importance of connection with God and connection with other people. Two weeks ago, we talked about how it is God's love for us that is meant to motivate us to obedience towards him. That as we look to see God's great love for us, that that is meant to inspire us to say, okay, God, yes, I believe that your way is best. And I want to follow you, not in begrudging submission, not, not out of some sort of you know, moralism or religious duty, but I want to follow you because I believe that following you is what is best and that that is a beautiful life, a life close to you. And then we talked last week about how, how it is God's love for us that gives us the fuel to love one another. It's the fuel to love one another. That as we see, as we sort of take off the mask and come to realize that we are broken people, who are loved deeply by God in our brokenness, that that is what produces in us love for others, love for others. So here's what we're going to see in our our passage today, is we're going to see one negative command. John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's going to give us this command. He's going to say, do not love the world. And we're going to get into what that means here in a second. But we need to be very clear about why that command exists in light of everything that I've just said. This command is not John saying, loving the world is bad and you need to be good, so don't love the world. This is not John saying, listen, I know you want the chocolate cake of the world, but broccoli is better for you, so take the broccoli. Right? This isn't moralism or legalism. This is John saying, if you love the world most... It is going to keep you from loving God and is going to keep you from loving others, the things that are so important to you and your quality of life. This is John saying, getting back to the appropriate expectations thing a minute ago, if you love the world most, you will seek ultimate fulfillment and significance in places that are simply unable to provide it. That is why this is so important. In fact, the fill in the blank on on your bulletin or if you're following along on the app, it is this. The world cannot give us what Jesus can. The world cannot give us what Jesus can. When John says don't love the world, he is telling us don't seek in the world what you can only get from God. Don't seek in the world what you can only get from God. So we're going to read this whole passage. It's only three verses, and then we're going to come back through and take it bit by bit. John chapter 2, starting in verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So the main point of the passage is right there in the beginning. Do not love the world. It's the only command in the passage. Everything else is basically commentary on that command or an incentive to obey it. But I would imagine you'll agree that is a somewhat ambiguous command. Do not love the world. What does that mean? First and foremost, we need to understand this is not primarily a condemnation of illicit pleasure. It is an invitation to deeper joy. This is not a condemnation of illicit pleasure. It is an invitation into deeper joy. Sin, we talked about this two weeks ago, sin is ultimately a matter of our affections. That you and I are led into sin, you and I are led into disobedience because we have come to believe, either consciously or subconsciously, that whatever it is we can get through our disobedience, whatever we can get through living in our own way is better than obedience to Jesus and what that will lead to. That is not true, but you and I, all of us, in different ways, we tend to believe that, either consciously or subconsciously, and that's what leads us in to sin. So when the scriptures call us away from something, when we see negative commands in the Bible saying, don't do this, don't be involved in that, don't let your heart go this direction, What the scriptures are primarily telling us is not don't do this because it's bad, although in many cases it is bad and it'll mess us up. What the scriptures are doing is saying don't do this because God has something better for you. Don't do this because God God has something better for you. The command to not love the world is not first and foremost a condemnation of illicit pleasure. It is an invitation to deeper joy. And when we grasp that deeper joy... What it does is it exposes illicit pleasure for what it is. 
ultimately harmful and destructive. Don't hear me endorsing illicit pleasure here or saying it's not so bad. But rather, what we need to do is instead of saying, okay, these things are bad, instead we need to say, no, no, what, what God offers me is so, so good that that helps me recognize that that which would pull me away from him, it just, I lose a taste for it. It is no longer appealing to me. Second, we need to be clear about what John is not referring to with the term world. He is not referring to the physical world, which is a gift from God to enjoy and steward. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, it says, God saw everything that he'd made, and behold, it was good. Similarly, the psalmist writes in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. God calls the created world good. He doesn't call us to, to not love or to hate that which he calls good. The physical world is meant to declare the glory of God. It is meant to show us God's creativity. I don't know about you, but I'm I'm an outdoor person. I love being outdoors. And over the summer, I had the chance with my family to spend a week uh, in Montana, which was just amazing. Montana in the summer, awesome. Montana any other time of the year, no thanks. But summertime, it's amazing. And we stayed in this little place right on the Swan River and a couple mornings on the trip, I would get my coffee and I would walk out and I would sit on this little deck overlooking the river and just the tranquility of the early morning water and the deep green of the trees around me and the blue sky and the whole, I'm just gonna go there in my mind here real quick. The whole, just the whole thing, it was so amazing. And what did that do? It stirred up worship in me. God, thank you, you have made a good and beautiful world for us to enjoy. We don't worship creation by any means, but creation is good and beautiful. John is not referring to the physical world. Similarly, this is very clearly not a command to not love the people in the world. I probably do not need to spend a lot of time making that point. We are called to love others. God God loves people. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Clearly, John is not saying we ought not love the world. Neither is he saying that we ought not participate in the economic and social structures that make up human society. Christians need to be careful that we're not formed by the values of the economic and social structures in society. But in general, we are not called to isolationism, nor are we called to avoid engaging with art, culture, or society at large. Now, we could talk about entertainment in culture, and I think there is wisdom in using some discernment and thinking through what are we exposing ourselves to in terms of entertainment. But the command to not love the world is in no way a wholesale condemnation of secular movies, music, or television. You don't love the world just because you like watching movies that don't star Kirk Cameron, okay? Like, that is, that is allowed, all right? So the world, in this case, then, is a reference to world systems that are opposed to the rule and reign of God. The world, in this case, is a reference to the world systems that would promote human self-sufficiency apart from God. It's that which would promote finding our identity, our vitality, and our purpose someplace other than in God. It is for this reason that Jesus' brother James writes in James chapter 4, he says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity towards God? That actually when we are formed by the world in that way, that is is pretty diametrically opposed to being formed by God. Or when Paul says in one of my favorite verses, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, do not be conformed to this world. What's he saying? He says, "Do, do not let the influence of the world be what forms your character. Do not let the influence of the world be what forms your values. Instead, he goes on to say, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let God continue to work in you and form you into his image. John goes on to say, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So when we speak of loving the world, we're speaking of attachment to world systems, or if you can maybe, maybe this metaphor will be helpful. We're talking about sort of throwing ourselves down on the proverbial potter's wheel of culture and letting culture be the thing that shapes us into its image. And that is an image that is always gonna be different than the image of God. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that no person can serve two masters. Either they will hate the one or love the other, or they'll be devoted to one and despise the other. And if you know the passage, he goes on to say, you cannot serve God and money, and that is certainly true. But you could also say the same thing about you cannot serve God and the world. 
We cannot at once say we are being formed into the image of God while at the same time saying I want to be formed into the image of the world. It just doesn't work. Charles Spurgeon, arguably the greatest preacher who ever lived, wrote these words 150 years ago and they, just, they could have just as easily have been written last week. He said, I believe that one reason why the church of God at present, this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. And I believe that's true. And I believe that sadly there are many examples of ways in which the church in America has been infected with worldliness. And that has nothing to do with the superficial, with music styles or clothing or anything like that. For many of us, if we're honest, we've just come to believe that what the world offers us is better than what Jesus offers us. And that's just not true. For many of us, we've even, you think about the ways that we go about seeking power and influence. And so often we do that according to the world's methods. The way of Jesus is growing increasingly foreign to us. Sometimes I'll hear people just either in personal conversations or you hear different things in the media or things like that. Well, I'll hear, I'll hear someone say something to this effect. They'll say, well, if I really operated my business like Jesus was truly number one in my life and faithfulness to him what was, was most important. Like, do you realize what that would do to my profit margin? Or they say, do you realize what my shareholders would say? Right? Or in the political world, if I really ran my campaign or operated myself in a way that showed that Jesus was most important and I want to be obedient to him and everything, you realize I wouldn't get elected, right? <laughs> like, because nobody else plays by those rules. And I could give you so many different examples. You realize that if we really aligned our lives with Jesus, you realize how, how that would negatively affect, or so we think, a different area of our lives. L listen carefully to what I'm saying and I'm not saying here. I believe that for the most part, you and I, in whatever world you're in, whatever sphere of influence you have, whatever your career is, all this stuff, for, for most of us, most of the time, we do not have to choose between effectiveness in the world, whatever that looks like for you, and faithfulness to Jesus Christ. I believe that God has made a world in such a way that we can be faithful to Jesus and that Jesus working in us and through us will allow us to be successful in different things. Not in like a health and wealth kind of way, but just we can, we can be effective in the world as we're being faithful to Jesus. But make no mistake about it, there are times when we do have to choose. There are times when we do have to choose. And this is probably not going to come as a huge shock to you, given where you are at this present moment and what I do for a living. <laughs> but when it comes to choosing effectiveness or faithfulness, I always encourage that you choose faithfulness, and I'll tell you why. I don't want to moralize it and say, well, if you're a good church person, you'll choose faithfulness, and if you're a bad worldly person, you'll choose effectiveness. I don't want to moralize it like that. I want you to choose faithfulness over effectiveness, and, I will, and I'll tell you why. Because if you continue to choose effectiveness, and if you say effectiveness, being effective in the world, accomplishing different things, that is what's, what is most important to me no matter what. Effectiveness will only continue to take and take and take and take from you to the point where faithfulness becomes almost unrecognizable. But if you choose faithfulness, if you choose faithfulness, God keeps giving and giving and giving in the sense of, no, your identity is secure. No, I love you in spite of your shortcomings. No, 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 whatever's going on, I'm with you. Now listen, I'm not saying that as Christ followers, we're called to ineffectiveness. In fact, some of you, one of your, pr your primary ministry to the world is you write great computer code or you build beautiful houses or you're an amazing and caring fourth grade teacher. I'm not by any means saying that we're called to mediocrity for Jesus to show that we don't love the world. But I'm saying there are times when we have to choose effectiveness or faithfulness, and the world cannot give us what Jesus can. If we value effectiveness above all else, it is only gonna continue to take from us. That is the world influencing the church, that is the world influencing us, and it's simply never enough. It's simply never enough. And, like, and so as we talk about influence of the world, as we talk about the world having influence over us, like so many other vices and hindrances, it is much easier to spot a love for the world or an over-attachment to the world in other people than it is to see it in ourselves. And like so many vices and hindrances, it is so easy to focus on behavior. When worldliness is not about behavior, it is about motivation. 
It is a matter of the heart. See, holiness, or choosing faithfulness over effectiveness, holiness is not about controlling our behaviors. It is about God changing our hearts so that our desires and motivations change. A love for the world is more reflected in our motivation than in our specific behaviors. Because when the world is shaping us, when the world is primary in our lives, we will not be shaped in a way where we're motivated by love for God and love for others. And that necessarily knocks us off course. So the question is, we're talking about love for the world in these sort of big and vague ways, but how do we know? How are we to know if the world has perhaps gotten too much of our hearts? Because like I said, that can be really difficult to see in ourselves. Well, you're in luck. I've got some questions for you to help diagnose this. This, this list is eight quick questions. This is not exhaustive, but these are just some questions that I came up with that, I, that can help us Did I say diagnostic? It's not exhaustive. That's what I meant to say. They are diagnostic. It's not exhaustive, but I think they can help us to see, okay, God, what is really going on in my heart? So if you're a note taker or you want something to maybe think through later on today, like here's just a few, I encourage you to maybe write write these down. Number one, what do I think about or talk about excessively? What do I think about or talk about excessively? Am I trying to say that you are too in love with the world if you like to talk about sports or movies or your hobby or your job or your home remodel or kind of whatever you've got going on in your life? No, I'm not saying that at all. But it's a different story if that's all we ever talk about. That's a different story if when our mind gets a free moment, it's always going to the same place, right? That can be an indication that something has perhaps taken a little bit too much of our hearts. Now, Am I suggesting you need to awkwardly insert the Lord into every conversation so as not to appear worldly? No, that's called being weird. Don't do that. But if there's no inclination to ever talk about the Lord or our thoughts just don't go there at all, that is an indication that there's something going on in our hearts. What do I think about or talk about excessively? Number two, when it comes to personal possessions, which can often be an indication, our approach to our possessions can tell us a lot about our hearts. When it comes to personal possessions, can I lend it out without freaking out? Can I lend it out without freaking out? Often an unwillingness to part with something or excessive anxiety about parting with something is a demonstration that it's got a little bit too much of our hearts. Now, am I saying you need to say yes to everybody that asks to borrow something all the time? No, if the guy with four speeding tickets asks to borrow your car, like there's some wisdom and some stewardship in saying, you know, um, no, actually, you can't because you drive too fast, right? But if we can't ever lend something out ever, or the thought of it breaking or being damaged produces excessive anxiety in us. What is, that's a key, that there's something going on in our hearts. Number three, where am I feeling dissatisfaction or envy? Where am I feeling dissatisfaction or envy? I don't think there's anything wrong with being consciously aware of, what, of like things you could do to help your life go a little bit better for you. Like for example, I know that if I slept a little bit more, and drank less than a gallon of coffee a day. That would probably be a positive life decision for me. I'm aware of it. I'm not doing anything about it, just so you know, but I'm aware of it, right? (laughs) Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with being aware of like, well, you know, a little more maybe financial discipline or like better behaved children or whatever. Like that would be a net positive in my world. But when that awareness becomes dissatisfaction or envy, Here's what that means. That means we have come to believe that what we see in somebody else or what we see out in the world, that we've come to believe that that is the key to our wholeness. And it's simply not. It's simply not. Whatever we see in others, whatever we see out in the world, that is not what's gonna make us whole. Jesus is what makes us whole. The person that, thinks, the, the person that you think has it made is looking for what's next, right? And everyone is struggling. Everyone is struggling. And if you remember that, honestly, like that is the thought that has cured me of envy. It's just recognizing everybody's struggling with something, so I need to have empathy, not envy. Number four, where do I find myself craving attention? Where do I find myself craving attention? I I will confess to you that I am a recovering attention hog. I lived way too much of my life really wanting people to notice me, and I'll just be honest, of all of my quirks, and believe me, they are many, 
that is probably the one that irritates me the most. Like, why? Why did I care so much for so long about people noticing different things? And if that's your world, if that's a struggle for you, here's the question. How much attention do you need before it's enough? How many? How many pats on the back? How many people need to tell you you're awesome before you're like, I'm good, I don't need to hear it anymore? How many? How many? Or how is your need for attention affecting your decision-making and your prioritization? How is your need for attention? What is that revealing about the state of your soul? Where do I find myself craving attention? Number five, what do I find myself imitating? What do I find myself imitating? Imitation is not a bad thing. I find myself imitating different mannerisms or nuances or things like that. If I listen to the same preacher on podcasts too many times, I start to like sound like them, but dumber kind of thing. But like, you know, superficially, I sound the same. I don't think imitation is a bad thing, but we need to pay attention to what do I especially subconsciously find myself imitating. Like for example, I, I cannot watch, whether it's TV or media or whatever, I cannot watch things that have a lot of arguing in them. First of all, I do not find it enjoyable at all. Second of all, I've just found it makes me more argumentative. That that actually is a formative influence to me that just makes me sort of short and catty and mean. So I need, am I saying it's wrong to watch things with arguing in them for anybody all the time? No, but it's wrong for me. What do you find yourself imitating? What do you, what do you find that's forming you? Or here's one, number six, where am I overreacting to things that don't matter that much? Where am I overreacting to things that don't matter that much? And I am gonna pick on sports fans here because I am one. And like, I really am one. Like my kids and I are gonna watch football later today. I was taping stuff yesterday. Like I am paying attention to sports all the time and I really enjoy it. It's something my kids and I love to do together. And I've really thought a lot about the role that sports plays in my life. I get that part of the fun with sports is pretending like they matter a lot. Like if you take that part out of it, it's not as fun anymore. And I think it's perfectly fine to cheer and hoot and holler and get excited again. I do that with my kids, I do that with my buddies. Like it's part of the fun. It's exciting, I like it, I think it's great. <clears throat> but when your team's sports schedule dominates your family schedule, or when we find ourselves treating our spouse or children poorly because our team lost, and research shows that is a thing that happens a lot and it is very dangerous. I mean, what is that? I mean, grow up! Like, you realize these people are strangers, right? Like, you don't know them. Like, they're just people on television. And again, I'm not, you're like, he's just saying that because he's not a sports guy. I am a sports guy. And listen, and just say, for those of you married to a sports person, before you like elbow them and say, see, listen, you've got it too. It's just about something else. <laughs> right? So every single one of us needs to say, come on, where am I giving too much of myself? Where am I overreacting to things that don't matter that much? That is, that is being formed by the world in a way that will never be enough. How many games your team got to win before you're happy for the rest of your life? I don't think there's an answer to that. We're going to move on. Number seven, where am I valuing effectiveness over faithfulness? Where am I valuing effectiveness over faithfulness? I said that, I talked a bit about that a minute ago, so I'm not gonna say more here. And number eight, where am I sacrificing my values for the sake of some sort of gain? This is a, this is a phrase that's been rattling around in my head for a long time, and I've used it to help me as I've just had to make difficult decisions in various areas of my life over the last you know, couple of years. Your values are your values until they're not. Your values are your values until they're not. Having consistent values that are applied across situations is very, very important to me, and as Christ followers, I believe it is a crucial part of our public witness. And if we're willing to sacrifice our values for financial gain, for professional gain, for gaining power or influence, or for avoiding a difficult conversation, or for any number of reasons, if we're willing to sacrifice our values for whatever, here's what that shows our values were never really our values in the first place. Our values were never really our values in the first place. Where am I sacrificing my values for the sake of some sort of gain? And listen, the point of me asking these questions is not that we need to feel guilty if the, if, if the answer to that question sort of pressed on something for us, because a lot of those questions, they press on something for me. But the point 
is these questions help us identify where have I given too much of my heart to the world? Where have I allowed the world to form me too much into its image? Listen, to identify that and to begin to change, that is a gift. That is a gift. Do not love the world or the things in the world, John says. That is not a restriction on your fun. It is an invitation to greater joy. It is not primarily a matter of behavior. It is about motivation and it is about heart condition. Insofar as we love the world, insofar as we are formed by the world, John continues, the love of the Father is not in us. God's heart for us is that we would avoid the pain of being formed by world systems that will never be enough for us. And instead, we'd be formed by the love of our heavenly father. The passage continues. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the father, but from the world. In the verse, John lays out three different types of desires. That if we allow them to fully influence us, they will be unable to deliver on their promises over time. And it's worth mentioning that these three types of desires These are the very same desires that Satan tempted Adam and Eve with back in Genesis chapter three. Real quick, you don't need to turn there, but listen to this, Genesis chapter three, verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that's desires of the flesh, that it was a delight to the eyes, that's desires of the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, that is the pride in possessions or the pride of life. She took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Furthermore, we don't have time to to go there, but in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus is tempted by Satan in the desert, the three ways that Satan sought to tempt him are through desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and pride in possessions. This is nothing new. The enemy has been using this to get after us from the beginning, and he's using them to get after us now. So what are they? Briefly, the desires of the flesh. When the New Testament uses the word flesh, it's a figure of speech for the part of our nature that desires that which is contrary to God's will. That which desires what is contrary to God's will. And again, the whole passage, this is much more about motivation than specific behaviors. Are there specific behaviors that we could talk about that I would say are are necessarily worldly all the time and we need to do whatever we can to free ourselves from them or some of us that are just kind of in the thick of them, we need God's help to free ourselves from them because they're just always worldly, always destructive all the time. Are there things that meet that description? Yes. But I think for most of us, this is how the desires of the flesh get us. Our desires of the flesh get control over us because they draw us to things that are morally neutral to an unhealthy degree. They draw us to things that aren't necessarily bad, but to an unhealthy degree. My sports example from a moment ago is a perfect example of this. There's nothing wrong with enjoying sports. When it dominates your life and affects your mood for days on end, that's a real problem, right? There's nothing wrong with buying things, having new stuff, but if you find yourself buying things because you're trying to numb something, or you find yourself buying things because you just need a quick hit of kind of the rush of getting something new. What is that? That's the desires of the flesh taking over. That's the desires of the flesh serving a role that God is supposed to serve for us. Or there's nothing wrong with having or seeking power or influence. But if we use that power to be served rather than to serve like Jesus did, what is that? That's the desires of the flesh, our desire for power taking over. Jesus has this line in Mark chapter eight that perhaps you've you've heard maybe many times if you're a church person, and it is just haunting to me. I think about it all the time, where he says, for what does it profit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? What does it profit a person to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? Unrestrained indulgence in the desires of the flesh may indeed gain us a lot in the short term, but the potential loss is tremendous. The potential loss is tremendous. And this, by the way, real quick, this is one of the benefits of fasting. We're moving into this season. We talked about this, a 40-day fast. We're starting this coming Wednesday for 40 days. We're, we're encouraging everyone in the congregation, just pick something in your life and set it aside for 40 days for the purpose of drawing closer to the Lord. The purpose of these fasts, it's not just needless deprivation, but rather it's an opportunity for us to notice that something is missing 
And when we notice that something is missing, that is just a little trigger. It's a key that reminds us where our sufficiency comes from. So what I like to do, like this is a little bit silly, but honestly, what I like to do every time we do a fast is I pick a few things that are usually related to like food or drinks that are very normal in my life and I'll set them aside because what are those? Each time, each time when I encounter the time where, hey, normally I would have coffee with cream and now I'm just having coffee. I'm not gonna give up coffee, that's just crazy. <laughs> Other things in my life need to be fixed before we can have that conversation. But like, it's a silly thing though. It's a silly thing to say, oh wow, you're fasting from coffee, that's really, wow, good for you. Well, first of all, I'm not trying to be impressive. Second of all, what's the point? The point isn't that it's some great sacrifice, the point is, is I notice it. And that in that moment, God, thank you that no matter what I'm gonna encounter this day, that you are the one who gives me identity, that you are the one who ultimately meets my desires, that I am not, I'm going into this day not seeking something, but rather, God, you have given me everything I need and I'm going out into the world to serve today, right? And then there'll be different things throughout my day as I walk by the treats and don't eat one or as I, you know, whatever, all these little things. So whatever it is for you, it doesn't need to be food or drinks. It could be, you know, sometimes I've like, I fasted from news. I even fasted from sports, which was a tough one, but I really noticed that. But you know, I fast from these, fast from these different things. And what's the point? The point is to say, God, you are better than these things. So I want to encourage you, even if you're not so sure, like, I don't know if I'm going to come tonight, or I'm not so sure if I'm going to come to the, to the, to the, the worship prayer and healing night at the end, I want to encourage you. In, first of all, I would encourage you to come to those things. They're going to be amazing. But second of all, even if you're not going to, engage with us these 40 days. You'll be glad you did. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a beautiful exercise in getting the desires of, our, of the flesh into their rightful place. So that's that. Second, desires of the eyes. These are desires related to what we see. When the desires of the eyes get out of control, we'll find ourselves prone to envy and coveting, believing in salvation through accumulation. When the desires of the eyes get out of control, we'll find ourselves drawn to that which is sexually illicit or degrading. And we live in a world, come on, we live in a world that is, that is oftentimes overwhelming in terms of the way that it stimulates the desires of the eyes in so many different ways. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. We have tremendous incentive to be careful and to pay attention to what we look at. And to pay attention not because God is going to be mad at us if we look at bad things, but because the things we look at form us in a sometimes imperceptible ways. So if, if walking through that neighborhood makes you feel like you need a bigger house to be content, honestly, quit walking through the neighborhood. Like, I'm not saying walking through that neighborhood is bad, but it's probably bad for you, right? If, if seeing these advertisements or being around these particular people, it stirs up something in you, then maybe you just need to back away from that until you can kind of get that under control. Be careful what you see. What you see, what I see, forms us. And then third, pride in possessions. Other translations translate this, the boastful pride of life. The Greek word literally means pretentious egoism. This is excessive pride in our accomplishments or our possessions. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with enjoying a compliment. Certainly beats the alternative. There's nothing wrong with having some measure of self-satisfaction in a job well done, with thankfulness to God for the opportunity, but just to be able to say, okay, I've done good work today, and I, that makes me feel good. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if we're living for the approval of others, that is extremely dangerous. And listen, we could talk about how when we live for the approval of others, our character and our values will be malleable to meet the demands of the moment. We could talk about that. Or we could talk about how when we live for the approval of others, we will be unable to be true to ourselves and who God made us to be. And we could talk about that. But once again, I want to point out that the biggest problem with living for pride and possessions or the approval of others is that there's never enough. There's never enough. How many people have to tell you you're awesome before you don't need to hear it anymore? There is no number. Approval is a drug, and it is a dangerous drug at that. It will never be enough for you, number one, to get back to what we talked about earlier. It's insufficient. And then number two, if your life is about attracting attention to yourself, you will be unable to love God and to love others, the things that will really fill your soul. Why? Because you're so focused on getting people to pay attention to you. It's a game you can't win. It's a game you can't win. 
I was a soccer referee for a lot of years when I was young, which is a great profession if you don't mind people yelling at you. And I remember serving as an assistant referee for a game in a tournament. And the way it works is you have a center referee and two assistants. And we were in a tournament, and this center referee, like he was, a, he was grown up, like way older than I was, real experienced guy. And we get done with the game. And we're all sort of in the middle of the field talking, and a tournament official comes up to us, and I, I, I don't know how many hundreds of games I referee. This is one of the few I remember. Tournament, tournament director comes up to us and says, hey, I just want you to know, the coaches of this game said you guys called a great game. And I'm expecting him to say, you know, oh, thanks, you know, that's good to hear. But this is what he said, almost dismisses the guy. He's like, oh, well, I don't really care about that. The three of us will talk here in a moment, and we'll decide how good of a game we, we refereed. Whoa. Like, that struck me as very arrogant in the moment. But then as I've thought about it, that's actually something I've held in, held in my heart because what's he saying? He's saying, listen, we're not going to let the opinion of coaches, we're not going to let the opinion of the crowd let us determine if we were faithful to the job we had to do today. He said, we're going to talk, did we faithfully and correctly enforce the laws of the game? And that is going to be what defines if we were successful today or not, not what the crowd has to say. I'm not saying we don't need to listen to other people. We all need people who can speak into our lives in different ways. But what I am saying is that your approval from others is not always the best indicator of your faithfulness to Jesus. The approval of others is not always the best indicator of your faithfulness to Jesus. And approval isn't bad, it's just insufficient. It's something the world can offer that will never be enough. All right, let's wrap this up. Verse 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride in possessions, they're passing away. The world's systems may seem quite successful today, but a day is coming when their utter insufficiency will be made known for all the world to see. There is much in the world that is good and beautiful and wonderful and a gift for us to enjoy, but ultimately the things of this world are fragile and they are temporary, and they are unworthy of holding the weight of our ultimate affection. But the text says those who are formed by Jesus, those who do the will of God will abide forever. And we did a whole teaching at the start of this year, two weeks on how do we understand the will of God. You can go listen to that if that's of benefit to you. But here's what we know from 1 John and other places, that to love God and to love one another is absolutely foundational to God's will for us. And when our lives are shaped by him, we are shaped by that which will remain for eternity. We, we are shaped by the one who gives us what the world cannot. We are free from seeking that which is never enough. And instead we can find our identity and our purpose and our livelihood in the one who is always, always always enough. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to invite the prayer team to come on up. These men and women would absolutely love the privilege of praying for you. So if there's anything that was stirred up this morning through music or the teaching or just anything you're walking through that you would just love to bring before the Lord, these, again, men and women would absolutely count it a privilege to be able to pray for you. So please come see them if that would be of benefit to you. If you're new or new-ish, would love to see you up at Introducing Bridgeway here in a few minutes. Uh, but let me just close in prayer and we'll be dismissed. God, you have given us a good and beautiful world to enjoy. But God, you have also been so kind to help us to see that what the world offers us is never enough. But that God, you have, in, you have instead told us that you are enough, that you desire for us to be formed by you, to be shaped into your image, to know your great love so that we desire obedience, and to know your great love so that we love one another. God, I pray for all of us in this room that even as, as we ask those diagnostic questions, if that stirred up something in us, God, I pray against any sense of guilt or shame, but rather, God, I pray that you would give us the courage to explore those questions in a deeper way, to help us see, is there something in our heart that has been given over too much to the world, something that has been given over to that which is not necessarily bad, but it just cannot handle our ultimate affections. And Holy Spirit, would you purify us? Would you purify our motives so that we would desire the things that are of you and that bring you glory? Because we know that that is for our joy. So again, give us the courage to press into that. Give us the courage to seek the transformation that you offer. And we thank you that we're able to do all of these things under the banner of your grace. We love you. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.